This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Welcome to the American Theatre Wing Seminars on Working in the Theatre. I'm Isabel Stevenson and I'm President of the American Theatre Wing. These seminars are perhaps the best known of the Wing's programs. Another program of the Wing that is equally as well known is its Tony Awards. An award that is created and has been given for the best in the theatre. It is for a, an excellence that has been found in the theater and is not really given for the longest run or the most commercial, but it is to reward the excellence of the craft in the theater. It is perhaps the highest honor that the theater can give. However, the wing is much more than that. It has a long-term long record of uh, giving to the community through the theater and the theater at large is a very, very important part of the community. From our famous stage door canteen comes a hospital program, which today continues to send professional live theater into institutions and hospitals. Our Saturday Theater for Children program is a most important and exciting program because on Saturday mornings, children line up and they buy a ticket and they go to the theater, but no child is ever turned away, and that way, they make a commitment to go to the theater. They make theater going a habit. It means that that will be the audience of the future. And at the same time, it is opening an entire wonderful, magical world that only theater can give to people. And these seminars are an outgrowth of the Wing School, where people like um, uh, Oscar Hammerstein and, and Dick Rogers and Harold Prince taught and uh, actors came to learn and to walk from one room to another to learn everything that they possibly could in what it is to work in the theater. And so the seminars that we are bringing to you are an outgrowth of that. Uh, they consist of the playwright, the producer, the performer, the director, and the scene and scenic design. All the people that make up what it is to work in the theater. I'm going to turn over today's seminar, which is on the playwright and director, to our co-moderators. Jean Dalrymple, who is a director, a, an author, a playwright, an actress, and a member of the board of the American Theater Wing. And Skyler Chapin, who is dean of the Columbia School of the Arts and is a, has been a member for many a year of the Tony Award nominating committee. Jean and Skyler, would you now take over and introduce this excellent panel that we have today? It's a pleasure. And uh, I'll start with uh, the gentleman farthest on my right, who has directed an impressive list of plays, including Crimes of the Heart, Da, The Effect of Gamma Rays on the Man in the Moon Marigolds, and also directed Nancy Donahue's The Beach House. And on top of all that, he has a daily soap opera in Brooklyn and is executive vice president of the Society of Stage Directors and Choreographers. Won't you greet Melvin Bernard? Bernard. <laughs> That's one thing about introducing somebody someone has known for a while. <laughs> the next gentleman is the author of K2, which ran on Broadway in 1983 and which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He's playwright in residence at the Circle Rep and the T. Schreiber Studio and is currently working on the film version of K2. Please say hello to Patrick Myers. <laughs> and on my immediate right, this delightful lady who has written for both stage and screen, including Moms, was an actress with the American Negro Theater and also served on the Council of the Dramatist Guild, Alice Childress. Thank you. 
on my far left is the gifted director of Mr. Myers K2. He also has his own studio, that, and he has produced and directed there for eight years. So he had plenty of opportunity to direct, and a wonderful job he did with K2 frightened all of us to death. <laughs> <laughs> um, right here is Nancy Donahue, who is an actress as well as a playwright. Uh, and she teaches acting at Marymount uh, uh, Manhattan College, a, a lovely place to teach, I think, and to, and to learn. I've, I've been there. Her most recent play, The Beach House, was at Circle Repertory. And I think we'll start now by asking everybody how they came to be a playwright or a director. And I'd like to start with Mr. Schreiber. Uh, I was an actor I when I first came to New York. I was an actor for, <laughs> I think, about 10 years here in the city. And uh, I started teaching acting. And uh, through the teaching, I started to direct. This was about 1969. And for me, it just became much more fulfilling than acting had ever been for me. And starting in 69 and 1970, we started to produce in what was then pretty much the beginnings of Off Off Broadway. And it grew from three productions in one season to four to five to six. And pretty soon, uh, I was doing a summer season as well as a fall through spring season. And I never made any conscious decision to quit acting. But it's just that directing took over and became far more interesting for me. So that's how I got my start with it. And listen to a voice that I should have listened to perhaps way back in college when I directed <laughs> before that. <laughs> how about you, Alice? Well, in, uh, I was working as an actress with uh, the American Negro Theater. We did a great many productions, but we wanted original work. And um, I became interested in writing to do original things uh, for us. And of course, um, I acted on Broadway and Anna LaCasta and things we did there then. But looking for uh, new work and scenes, I started out with one-act plays and then uh, did other things and Trouble in Mind and Wedding Band and a uh, uh, great many plays. Uh, people began to expect plays from me. And I also felt I could create more there than as an actress, uh, because you could start at the beginning. And I feel when I've written a play that I've acted all the parts first. <laughs> <laughs> you um, probably have. <laughs> yes, I did as I was writing them. But I also enjoyed being an actress, and <clears throat> I have done directing, creating something for other people to have. Uh, I remember Harriet Tubman, who freed people during slavery underground railroad she said she always wanted an apple orchard and she didn't have one and it was such a pleasure to plant a tree that would give apples to others meaning her work and i feel that way about what i've done i tried to write the kind of roles that i felt uh we didn't have as much of an opportunity to play and uh so i it seemed to me directing and acting and any part of theater was a joy. And in writing books, I use theater technique and carry the theater to a book. I see writing a book in terms of scenes. A Hero Ain't Nothing But a Sandwich was in scenes, <laughs> and uh, also uh, Rainbow Jordan and A Short Walk and things. The theater is such a real and fascinating and deep and wonderful place to be that once in it, I don't see how people can get away from it. <laughs> Nancy is also an actress and a playwright. Yes. Is that more or less the way you feel about it? I, I do feel that way about it. I, I, I especially agree with you when you say that you uh, act every part as you write it. I, 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 I think it's very thrilling to be able to be a guy, you know, for a while, and, you know, <laughs> a romantic guy. You, know, you never get a chance to be a romantic guy in life. You know? But um, uh, I, I started writing uh, in 1978, which I had been in the theater as an actress for a long time and had never thought of writing uh, anything except letters. And uh, <laughs> I was very sick. I had a crippling illness from which I unfortunately now recovered. 
Um, but I, I was very, very sick at, 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 in 1978, and it seemed to me that I would never be able to do anything in the theater again. And I was terribly unhappy one day, and uh, because of my illness, and uh, everything was crashing down around my ears, and everything was so dreadful. And there wasn't any area of my life at that moment that was not under siege. And there was nothing pleasant anywhere, not anywhere. And I said, I'm going to write something nice, because I have to have something nice somewhere. Because if I don't have something nice somewhere, I'm not going to be able to go on. So I went into my living room, and, and I took a pile of pencils and a, and a notebook, and I just started writing. And I, and I looked at it after I had written for a little while, and I saw that it was in play form. It was a scene. And I thought, <laughs> I, can, I can write. And then I thought, well, now I can do that instead of acting, because I couldn't act. I couldn't walk, you know, so I couldn't really very act very well. And my hair had all fallen out, which was very uh, uh, alarming to me. I didn't know whether it would grow back, because it wasn't chemotherapy. It was something else. And I just was... You know, so I thought, well, I'll write myself a part in which I have a lot of hair. And, and it, was very, it was a very happy experience. That's, That's a wonderful beginning. <laughs> and, and you, Mr. Myers? Uh, I was I was working as an actor in the Bay Area mm -hmm. and uh, so. and working as a director for a. a local access for a cable uh, outlet, just doing little shows, community shows. And sort of through helping people put on programs, I discovered I kind of had a, uh, a way with uh, dialogue, a way with dialogue. And, uh, <laughs> and that's what started me writing plays and generally, you know, going in that direction. Melvin. Well, um, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and I used to go to movies all the time. I love <laughs> movies. And then when I was 12, my older brother, bless him, took me to the theater, and I saw a performance in Summer Stock. And I just knew that was where I had to be. There was nothing like the excitement of live theater, being in the same room with the event and participating in that event, whether you were on, in the audience or on the stage or wherever. And so that's... Um, um, what I decided would be my life, and uh, it's lucky to decide early on to know what you want to do and then be able to do it and be allowed to do it. Mm. Um, I went on to drama school and worked as a stage manager and all of those things. But not as an actor? No, only playwrights work as actors. <laughs> <I see>. <laughs> <laughs> and all directors are bearded. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a cover, it's a, you can hide. <laughs> So we can't grow up in the air in the air. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Play, playwright Myers, where did you get the wonderful idea for K2? Uh, I read a book called Four Against Everest by uh, Woodrow Wilson's grandson. I can't remember his first name now. I'm sorry about that. But his last name is Wilson. <laughs> and uh, and it, in it, he described a, an alpine sort of attempt on Everest with four men and, and how he became... Uh, uh, trapped overnight with a guy who had a, a head concussion and, and so was uh, a little out of his mind and, and just the struggle that they went through. And I thought that's a great uh, situation, a real pressure cooker situation for a drama. Um, mm. But I didn't really have a theme for it at the time, but that's how uh, I got the idea from reading that story. How did you just start writing it? Did you just sit down and... No, I researched... <laughs> As Nancy did to start well, to write, and there it was. <laughs> uh, no, but I'm not right away. But uh, after reading for about a year, though, that's kind of what happened. You know, after I, you know, re read uh, uh, a lot of mountain climbing uh, articles, journals, and books. Then when I did write it, I it would, too was involved with something in my personal life that was real painful, and I <laughs> felt that I had a choice to either, you know, keep on keeping on, <laughs> as they say, <laughs> you know, uh, or. Uh, <laughs> Or just, you know, uh, drop dead. So I wrote the play. <laughs> <laughs> the therapy of theater. Yeah, yeah. really. And then you, you took to directing it, which was marvelous. Did you know each other? Or? Oh, yeah. Terry had uh, directed my, f the first play I had directed in New York at uh, Circle Rep, The Lot, and, uh, and also Glorious Morning, the second play I had at Circle Rep. So we had a relationship uh, going on back for years by mm -hmm. then, yeah. 
Did you did you take any formal kind of writing training as a playwright, or what was your education? I, I went to college to, to become a, what to become an. Well, I, I took creative writing. I was interested in being a novelist, and uh, my uh, teachers advised me that I should think of doing something else. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this sign for an audition for the theater, and I. Uh, uh, tried out for uh, a play in college and didn't get the part, but it was such a wonderful experience, uh, personally, for all the wrong reasons that I jumped right into the theater. So, you know. But then, did you go back and, and study any form of writing? Um, well, I read a lot, and I read a lot mm -hmm. of plays, and I read a lot of books. You know, I mean, that's I think is a, you know for a writer a really good way of studying. Um, but that's yeah, basically mm -hmm. it. Yeah. What about you, Mel? You just glanced over drama school. You went to drama school? And oh, it, no, it, I didn't mean to glance over it. <laughs> uh, no, I worked very hard. Uh, I went to Yale, and uh, the program there at that time was this incredible saturation. We had, uh, there wasn't anything called a directing major. It was called production major. And we did everything. We designed costumes, and we built scenery, and we lighted shows. Um, not the major ones, but we had to learn, and I think that was a big help, we, uh, big help in um, w dealing, theater is a collaborative venture, certainly, and uh, the more you understand about the work that your collaborators do, uh, the easier it is to collaborate. And uh, so that was great training. And then I came to New York, uh, raring to go, and uh, went to work in a bakery, and. <laughs> uh, worked as an usher at the uh, Kaufman Concert Hall and mm -hmm. uh, eventually got um, uh, some work as a stage manager at the Phoenix Theater, which was down on 2nd Avenue and 12th mm -hmm. Street in those days. And, um, and then I went and taught at the Goodman Theater in Chicago for five years. I taught uh, uh, acting and uh, stage management, which was uh, <laughs> my professional experience up to that point. Um, and did a lot of directing and learned a great deal from doing it, which I think is true for all of us in this business. It's like driving a car, you get your license and then you learn how. <laughs> uh, and then I came back to New York and worked as an assistant to Alan Schneider uh, for a year and then began to do some things in workshops and pl uh, various places around town. and. Uh, off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, wherever, and mm -hmm. uh, regionals, and I still do. Yes, I know that. <laughs> I'd like to return to K2, which I really liked very, very much, and ask Mr. Schreiber how you began with the idea of directing it, because it was really wonderfully directed. Thank you. Uh, Patrick and I really have a very close collaboration, and I think it is, when you're working with a playwright, very much a marriage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> From the courtship days when everything is very romantic to getting down to the reality of the yes. production, <laughs> when some of the romance goes and you really get down in the trenches <laughs> together. And Pat writes with a passion that really excites me enormously, that it has in all of his plays. And uh, I think when the first play first came to me, uh, I had I knew nothing about mountain climbing at all. And I read the play. I remember I was taking about a week's vacation. I read the play in Florida. And I was just <laughs> overwhelmed by it, absolutely overwhelmed. And uh, then I think Patrick and I, I did the first production of the play up in Syracuse. And Patrick was in Washington at the time uh, doing another production of it. And Pat came over to Syracuse. And we did some work on the script together uh, in Syracuse. and. Uh, <coughs> Pat and I both were very pleased with the mounting of the play in Syracuse. And uh, we went on from there uh, with the New York production. Uh, I sit down and work really, I try to come up with my own production book and then sit down with the playwright, in this case with Patrick, and really do line by line breakdown. Uh, I did a lot of research. I started to read a number of books, uh, uh, K2 to Savage Mountain, which was a very helpful book in, in research and my becoming acquainted just with the equipment. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I didn't know what a beaner was any more than the man on the moon when I started reading this stuff. What is a beaner? <laughs> <laughs> nice master. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that's fastened into an ice screw and, and something they run a rope to. Uh, and I was just amazed at this whole world that opened up with the play and then starting to interview some people who had actually climbed some pretty tall mountains. And it was an incredible world that dropped in on both of us, a, a sport that uh, 
uh, doesn't get that much publicity and draws a very interesting kind of man or woman to do it. There's a wonderful program on, I think, this <coughs> Sunday night uh, uh, with the woman on K2 that climbed K2 and later fell and died, right. I think, coming down. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes an incredible amount of courage, and it's a theme of uh, men surviving or women surviving, because a lot of them are climbing now too, that just attracts me a great deal. I, I, I was very attracted to the humanity in the play, uh, the love that's in the play, and the tremendous passion that's in the play. And, and all that the lesson, mm -hmm, the yes. lesson of learning yes. how to let go really in order to begin again, which is a terribly important theme. I mean, Nancy was just talking about that. And, and it is an important theme, and, yeah. it, and it was absolutely brilliantly done. Uh, Thank you, it, um, I missed a beat, Thank you. though. Well, when did you make the transition from acting to playwriting? I started to make it in about 1970, really, when I uh, started with my acting school and we started to do productions. Mm -hmm. And I directed the Before first... Before then, had you studied acting? I'd studied acting. I was an actor in New York for about 10 years and appeared off-Broadway and on-Broadway mm -hmm. and did some television and a lot of uh, summer stock at that time when it was still in existence and uh, <laughs> worked uh, briefly with the adjunct of the APA company. And then I had acted, I'm from Minnesota, and I acted, had acted for about four years there before coming to New York. Mm -hmm. And it was just a kind of a natural switchover. And it was really like on the job training with uh, my acting school, and we started to do productions. Mm -hmm. And I started to learn from that. I think that's interesting, having, as you said, oh, the playwrights mm -hmm. were actors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you <coughs> stepped across, when mm -hmm. you decided to do that. Nancy, I want to ask you something. The, um, <coughs> when you eloquently described recovering from a, a devastating illness and going and taking pads and lots of pencils and starting to write. That, that is uh, an extraordinary and gripping story, but how did you get started writing in the first place? I mean... That's it. That's it? That's what happened. I just... I, I always... Uh, my, my mother always said, and my father always said that I was a writer, so I assumed that I was because they told me I was. And, and I think it was because when I was a little girl, I wrote lots of creative writing things that, that they agreed with, you know. I mean, I would write stuff that sounded like a, a commercial for their points of view, my, my parents' points of view. And so, I mean, in order to please them, it was all very innocent. But uh, so they thought I was a writer, and, and I just assumed that I was. And then when I, I needed to say to be to, to have something nice it, it I just thought that I, I had to make it up mm -hmm. and I would write it down so I could read it over and that, that literally is how I began but I think um, that what helped me although this was not anything that I used consciously but what helped me was I studied for a long time uh, 12 years in fact at that point I had studied uh, for 12 years with Uta Hagen, and she, she'd written that wonderful mm -hmm. book, you know, Respect yeah. for Acting, and, yeah. and it had come out during the years that I was working with her, and, and I had absorbed it very thoroughly, you know, and all of the nine questions that you ask, and the structure that is used and everything, and, and, and so when I was writing the scenes, I, I knew to cover certain bets, you know, I knew that you had to know where it was, I knew that if you knew where it was, that that would in some ways influence what it was. And so I started very strongly with a very, um, very detailed and specific and personal place that, that, and then I, and I picked two very definite, specific, detailed, personal people, and I put them in the place, and then, you know, they just started running around and doing things. I remember, <laughs> and I was watching them. It was like I was a movie camera. I was writing it down and writing it down. I remember one night, and this was a real early version. This was the beach house that I was writing. And, and this was a very early version. And, and uh, Annie uh, ran upstairs, and she was going to wait for John in the bedroom. And, she, and he was, John was going to come upstairs. And John was downstairs fiddling around, you know, which was, I don't know why he was doing that. You know, and Annie <laughs> went upstairs. And I was writing, you know, while I wa watched her do this, and she ran upstairs, and she went into her bedroom, and which she had been staying in, and she took her pocketbook, and she went down the back stairs and got in the car and drove away. And I said, what? No! How can she? This is the love scene, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> Same thing happened in the play that I'm, that I'm doing in a workshop production of now. I, I was writing along and they were screaming at each other and fighting. And all of a sudden she threw the ring at him and the window was open. It went out the window. And I said, how can I have the ring go out the window? It's 57th Street. I thought. <laughs> so that became the centerpiece of the of the of, of the of this little play. Is that your thing? Is a one act, things. one woman, one performance? Is there such a thing? Is a one act, one woman, one writer, one performance play? Because oh, you are it. Oh, you're no. wonderful. No. No. Oh no. <laughs> no, no, I think so. <laughs> Isabel is just referring to the fact that you managed to do you? all the characters. Oh, oh, I see. Oh no, I just. Oh no. Not tomorrow. No. no. <laughs> And now may I present our new arrival, our dear Walter Dallas, a director who has worked at Yale University. And, uh, and he was the director of the recent production of Moms, which was, uh, had a very nice success at the Hudson Guild Theater. Walter Dallas. Thank you for coming. I must apologize for being late. I've spent the last 25 minutes sitting somewhere between Newark and New York on the train. <laughs> I'm yeah. from Philadelphia, so. And I think that we should re return and ask him how he got started Absolutely. as a director, since we've gone through that with the others. I always loved theater. I guess, I guess we all did. It. But as a child, uh, I went to a, a school. I'm from Atlanta and uh, grew up there and went to a school that every year, as you know, we did the Nutcracker Suite every year, and there were May Day activities. <laughs> and I, I loved it and, 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 and waited. I think I behaved in school just so that we could get to that time of the year and we could perform. Uh, and I went to college and then majored in, in, in theater and English. But I really didn't know that I, that I wanted to go as far into, into theater as, and I loved it, but I didn't think at that time, it was very difficult to even imagine uh, someone going into theater as a profession. Other people did it. People mm -hmm. in New York did it, but not people in Atlanta. Uh, in my senior year in college, I had, had already accepted a, a fellowship to study uh, uh, divinity at Harvard. And for my final directing project, I had to direct a, sort of a one-act play. Uh, it was a piece by Arthur Copet. He's partially responsible for my being here. Um, the, it, just ha it happened that the director of my theater program was a Yale graduate. And Constance Welch, who had been the director of the directing of the program there for a while, was visiting him. And at 8 o'clock that morning, for some reason, she came with him to our directing class, saw the one-act play that I did, and offered me a scholarship to Yale, sort of on the spot. Aww. So I went into the directing program at Yale with a mission. The idea was that, that I didn't think that, the, that, there were, that there were serious actor training programs in Atlanta. And, and I wanted to go away and learn all that I could and then come back and start a company that had a school attached to it. So Yale was the first stop and um, then, I, then I started teaching to test some of the ideas. At Yale I worked, this was under, under Robert Brewstein, and there I met people like Paul Sills and Arnold Weinstein and we toured and, and, and I learned quite a bit. Uh, then I started teaching. I taught for a while at Antioch College and then I taught at UC Berkeley. Then I decided I wanted to write. I had an idea <laughs> for a play. So uh, not quite knowing how to go about it, I simply resigned my job at Berkeley, sold my car, and moved to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and proceeded to write this, write this, this play. Uh, while I was in Hawaii, though, before, I could get, before my characters were up and talking to me, a friend, a friend got a fellowship to go to Africa uh, to do uh, an educational film for the schools in, in, in Honolulu. And he needed a camera person. I volunteered uh, and then immediately ran out and bought everything I could find. How do you work with camera? You know, what's <laughs> <laughs> and so we spent a year in Africa and I had an opportunity to study at the University of Ghana some, some theater techniques there at the Institute of, uh, of African Studies. And um, our year took us from Ghana over to Tanzania um, and then back to Hawaii. And then I decided I was ready to go back to Atlanta and start my company. Um, I called a friend of mine in Atlanta who had just been made Commissioner of, of Arts, Michael Lomax, and said, Mike, I'm ready to come home. Can I start a company? What can you do? He said, sure, there's a thing, there's a CETA program going. Come on and, and, and I'll set you up with something. I didn't know what that was. I'd been in Africa for you know, almost a year and a half. 
So on the way there, and I didn't realize there were deadlines. On the way there, I stopped in San Francisco to direct a play. <laughs> Got to Atlanta and realized that, that, there, that there were no jobs. So I started my company, and there I met a guy named, uh, named um, uh, Bernard Havard, uh, who, who was head of the Alliance Theater. We did a production of The Seagull. I love Chekhov. And we did a production of The Seagull with a company I started. It was an all-black company. And we were in a little schoolhouse across the tracks. And we did the production. We had no money, so we had no props. Uh, we had no money, so we had no costumes. Um, we just sort of did it. And we did it in the round. And Bernard saw it, loved it, and invited us into the Alliance Theater, which is the Memorial Arts Complex. I'm getting there. Uh, <laughs> um, we did several plays there. And there I met people like Bill Gunn and, and other writers, Sam Art Williams. Um, um, and Bernard recommended me for a program that I'd never heard of. It was called the Director's, I think Director Fellow, Director's Fellow Program with the National Endowment for the Arts. And the idea was we would go away for a year and visit as guest directors at theater companies. <clears throat> so that sort of worked out, and I ended up at Center Stage in Baltimore, where they were looking for a play to do. They had their season slotted out except one play. And I suggested a play called The Amen Corner by James Baldwin. Um, they had never heard of it. They'd heard of it, but never read it. They liked it, asked me to direct it. Uh, and a lot of people from New York were involved. And they kept saying, you know, you really need to go to New York. And I said, no, I have a company in Atlanta. I have to get back. And they said, one year in, in New York is fine. So I started writing everyone I could. I wrote Joe Papp. I wrote uh, Woody King. I wrote the Negro Ensemble Company, where I really, really wanted to work. And I got nice responses, except from Doug Ward at the Negro Ensemble Company. Nothing. <laughs> the, the play went up. Lynn Meadow, everyone responded. The play went up and went down, and Doug hadn't responded at all. I was furious. <laughs> I made an appointment to go and see him, because I figured this would be an audition. How do, you go, how do you come to New York as an unknown and start working if no one knows your work? I didn't know what I was going to say to him, but I was furious. I put on, <laughs> I put on my combat boots. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, I was really, and I went up, and I, I made an appointment. They said, you have 10 minutes with Douglas Turner Ward. I had no idea what I was going to say. I waited for half an hour in this little room after the appointed time, and in walked Doug. We were dressed exactly alike. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, I, my beard was full. I, mean, we were, I had a beret. I mean, I was, ready, I was ready for action. He had a beret, and the, the 15 minutes turned into a two and a half hour talk, and he allowed me to direct the first play of their season. And that's, that's how I ended up in New York. Uh, and apparently, Frances Foster was in that production name in the corner, and apparently, she had talked to him a lot about the experience, and based on that, uh, I was given my first show. And that was my first show in New York. Bravo. <laughs> it was a play by Ray Arana called Sons and Fathers of Sons, um, which starred Felicia Allen Ayers, who's now moved on to The Cosby Show, and, and some of the other NEC regulars. Um, the show after that was, uh, my next show in New York was a play called Welcome to Black River, uh, which was done at the Henry Street by Sam Art Williams. The next was Eyes of the American uh, by Sam Art, which was done at NEC uh, with Glenn Turman and uh, Surrett Scott. And uh, Moms by Alice Childress <laughs> was my fourth. <coughs> yeah. yes. Well, that was a marvelous beginning. It went on and on. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Tell us about your experience. Well, uh, first, since you were asking where people, you know, came from, their writing and how it started, <clears throat> even though I was with the American Negro Theater, I think my grandmother started me writing, really. And um, she would sit by the window with me and say, there's a man going home. I wonder what his name is. Mm -hmm. And I'd give him a name, and then we'd say, how m she'd ask how many children he had, and where he worked and oh. what he had done and so forth. And I don't think she called herself um, making me a writer. She was fascinated. Perhaps she should have been a writer also. She, <laughs> she said, uh, now that's very important. I like how you did that. Why don't you write it down? And she had a big, uh, 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 a huge purse that she put these writings in every time. And then sometime we'd find something in the paper and she'd cut it out and so forth. And we found ourselves building stories, and uh, I was doing most of it, and then she'd say, my eyes are tired, you read it back, and so forth. I was getting a good training. Her mother had been 
uh, a slave in uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, my great-grandmother. Uh, my grandmother had gone to the fifth grade in school, and she was a highly uh, 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 skilled and educated woman, self-educated. And she used to take me in art uh, galleries all up and down uh, Madison Avenue and, and ask. I was so embarrassed she could say, this is my granddaughter, and uh, we don't have any money, but if you're not busy, could you explain these paintings to her? <laughs> because I would like her, and of course, people were always very, most gracious about it. But also, on the tough side, uh, my education was confined to Harlem until in the 60s, I was proposed by Tilly Olson uh, to, uh, to get a Harvard appointment to the Radcliffe Institute for Independent Study, which was a doctoral program. On the basis of the writing I had done prior to that, uh, I was accepted. And I worked two years there on writing, selecting to audit the courses only that I wanted to attend. And I had the book stacks open to me, which was good. I could take the books back and forth uh, to New York. And uh, in 1984, I received the uh, Alumni Graduate Medal for um, the work that I've done uh, since then. But the hard part <coughs> is that in South Carolina, I came through a time of Jim Crow. And we were not allowed to use the public libraries. We were not allowed to use the concert halls. And of course, in my great-grandmother's time, it was against the law to read and write. And so uh, uh, the matter of education was important to a great many people. And Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, uh, many uh, black people went to prison for reading the book secretly really? because it was an anti-slavery book. And they had to go in basements to read and oh. so forth. When my play Wedding Band was done on uh, uh, ABC television, produced by Joseph Papp, he had done it first uh, uh, at the New York Shakespeare Festival, it was about South Carolina and uh, interracial relationships and uh, about the 1916 and 18. It was banned in eight stations out of 168, and one of them uh, was South Carolina, Charleston, where I was born, uh, they said it could be seen after midnight only. <laughs> but uh, a few years later, Mayor Riley declared Ellis Children's Week, and the play was done in public, and also a play about John's Island, about the people there. I was so thrilled. It was the best moment in my life. The first play these people ever saw was about themselves. And I wrote it, and we did 120 performances. It was put on by the State Council on the Arts. And uh, it was a very thrilling experience. At the same time, the Dock Street Theater, that um, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, in America, would not allow the play to appear there. So a doctor's theater in a hospital did it in Charleston. Uh, then Columbia uh, announced it as Alice Childress Week. We played 120 performances in prisons, open places, all taken around by the state council. So what I am saying, that the, coming out of the whole Jim Crow experience was what I and many others had to do. And uh, it was very often difficult. But it made me find my writing material in Harlem and in Charleston and in the islands there. And that took me to Africa. I also went to Ghana uh, uh, out there at the University of Ghana. A wonderful contribution mm -hmm. you've made. So uh, uh, what I'm saying, theater comes from strange places, mm -hmm. that it comes mm -hmm. from the people, it comes from the earth, that I found the scenes they were playing without thinking of it as becoming a writer. And uh, so I give this to others as best I can. Wonderful. It's a wonderful story. Wonderful story.
I'd like to get into the director-playwright relationship. What does a playwright look for in a director and vice versa? What's the, what, what do you ask? What do you, what do you want? Hmm? Uh, well, I have to have a gut response to the script. Uh, that's my criteria. Uh, I've, uh, it's got to be a script that scares me. Uh, I work better when I'm scared. <laughs> uh, and I, it's got to be a script that I have a gut response to. And uh, then I like to read it, put it away for a week, come back to it, read it again. And I know if it builds, I got to go. I got to do it. That's what I look for. What about you? Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what happens. There's some place I read and I just know that I want to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Something, you know, it suddenly appears in my head and. I'm selfish enough to want to put that on the stage rather than have someone else do that. <laughs> Does it have to be someone you know, someone whose work you've seen, or suppose? No, no, a, no. I can read the script. Really I had never met Nancy. Yes. I don't. Uh -huh. Well, we had met once. Met I once, saw the yeah. play actually yeah. in an earlier version. But um, uh, no, I um, uh, I once read a play in a, a British theater magazine and. Uh, went marching over to my agent's house, we were at, uh, at the beach, and went mar marching over to his house and said, I've got to do this play. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out the author was from my hometown. We had just missed knowing each other. It's Pete Gurney, A.R. Oh, Gurney, no. Jr. The play was called Children. But I just read this play and I said, I have to do this play. Um, I've forgotten, did you? Yes, I did, oh. at the Manhattan <laughs> Theater Club, mm -hmm. <laughs> with Nancy Marchand and Swissy Kurtz, yeah. and I had a well, wonderful time. Yes, of course. Yes, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, sometimes the play just, you know, appears in my head, I guess the way characters appear to writers, and uh, I, I, I feel I must do that. And it's not necessarily something, uh, I mean, the effect of Gamma Rays and Man in the Moon Marigolds is about a mother and her daughters, well, I come from a family of sons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've never, and I've done more sister plays. Huh? <laughs> um, how, do you, how do you work with it? How do you know what the playwright, how does the playwright want, tell you what he wants, or do you have to feel your way around it? Well, I think What's we, that first meeting? Uh, I, I, the first thing I think we, is we have to get together and make sure that, that we're talking about the same mm -hmm. play. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> because uh, uh, I That's can read a play and see totally other things. Uh, than what a playwright saw when he or she mm. wrote it. And uh, it's important that we're talking about the same vision uh, because otherwise we're going to get in trouble later. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the best thing is to just trust your instincts. We sat down together and talked and I think uh, we got along okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and still do. And we had a terrific time working mm -hmm. on it. I must well, tell you something about Nancy, if I may, just in, in terms of a very practical thing that happened in the work experience. Uh, we were, I think this was the day before our first audience, our invited audience, and then we're going into previews at the Circle <laughs> Rep. And uh, Nancy had gone out to dinner and I was laying on a sofa or, or something in, in, in the, in the uh, theater and um, thinking very hard. And she came back and, and I looked very dramatic lying there as if the world had just ended. And I said, Nancy, we have got to take a half an hour out of this play right now or we're in big trouble. And Nancy looked at me, <laughs> a fleeting moment of panic, grabbed her script and sat down. During the run through that night, she shaved a half an hour out of that play. We didn't cut anything. I said there are two ways to do this. One is to lose a lot of major stuff you know, take out some mm -hmm. of the stuff. And the other way is to uh, thin it out. Mm -hmm. She did that mm -hmm. in one night. I mean, through Western. one run through. <laughs> she sat there with her script and did this. Mm -hmm. There's so much of it that we could only get one act of it in the next afternoon and the second act we got in the next day. But, and, and she did an extraordinary job without violating the material in any way. It just goes to show that I had overwritten. <laughs> it's that attitude I just that's, love. Yes, but that's also unusual for a playwright who falls in love with every word. <coughs> and every word is so important I that think it's that high. Uta taught me, you know, and or maybe it wasn't Uta, I don't know who it was, but somebody taught me somewhere along the line that if you fall in love with it, that that means yeah. that it's yeah. probably the thing that ought to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because once, I, I don't know. What about well, you, Patrick? How do you feel about How do you choose? Uh, for me, it's okay. like it, if the moment's working on stage, that it's not so much a matter of, I mean, words on stage are 
more to promote uh, an interaction between people in a dramatic, you know, confrontation. And if it's not doing that, it may be beautiful, it may be uh, wise, it may be, you know, incredibly uh, cutting and illuminating, but it's like getting in the way of the play, you know, mm -hmm. the, the drama. So get rid of it if it's not doing the job of moving it along. Would you Who, by the way, uh, selected the wonderful scenic designer for your play? Uh, well, okay, actually, uh, Ming Cho Lee was uh, selected by uh, Up in uh, Arena Stage. No, at Arena Stage. Um, uh, boy, I don't believe it. Here it is. <laughs> the brain that has no function. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't believe it. Uh, I, I mean, by the Arena Stage in Washington. Yes. Zelda. Zelda Pichetter, who was <laughs> an incredible, forceful, wonderful lady who <laughs> scared her name right out of me. <laughs> she, uh, she, uh, it's an easy name to forget. No, uh, 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 wonderful, wonderful woman and very yeah, strong person. But she picked Ming, and I uh, was overwhelmed when I first walked into the theater and saw that 35 foot. I uh, thought, my God, this guy is crazier than I am. Spent <laughs> <laughs> a lot of time and good time uh, going through the script and, uh, as you said, gleaning out a lot of uh, a lot of what had become sort of phone book dialogue to cover all of these climbs that mm -hmm. I had in earlier productions, but now I had a 35 foot wall and it was like, now we're really going to get into right. you know, the yellow pages. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so I, I had to really like go back to the script and change a few, you know, central things in the script to uh, streamline it for his wall and uh, it really helped the play a lot. Yeah. But it was Zelda who uh, chose him. I'd like to ask Walter his reaction to moms, to Alice's moms. It's, isn't it remarkable? Uh, I suppose that it was planned, but I think it's the first time that we've had actor and playwright on, on several very famous plays. And would you it was interesting. The, it was kind of an interesting coming together. Uh, I knew uh, again, from Atlanta, I sort of knew about the greats, and, and I had read so much of Alice's work, and, and I got a call actually from Clarice Taylor, who played Moms, saying that she had a script, and it was about Moms Mabley. I was interested immediately, um, and uh, she said she'd send it, and I said, great, you know, I'd love to see it. She didn't tell me then, I don't think, that it was by Alice. So when I got the script and saw that it was Alice, I was really excited. I mean, that's kind of how we came together. Um, this, the, the piece had, had been done kind of in an earlier um, stage, kind of a, mm -hmm. do you Once want to talk a about green that? Plays, a green plays, where yes. they only try out for the summer. It's only two years old, uh, mm -hmm. green plays group, but they're doing wonderful work with just simply to do it for uh, authors and and they did small, it with, with yes, this they did. Mm -hmm. this one. So mm -hmm. I really came into kind of an ensemble that was ready to, you know, explore the piece further to move it to another level. So it was um, it was the first time that I'd had that experience of, of coming into um, a situation, and we did look at other actors as as possible, but that ensemble that had grown at Green Plays was was absolutely right for the piece. So it was an interesting situation coming into a piece that sort of had a life of its own and an integrity and an, and a, an ensemble sense that you wanted to preserve. Uh, and yet you want, you know, the, the goal was to make it stronger and sharper. And this is where working with Alice became kind of an interesting thing. Because at first I was a little caught, I didn't quite know how to work in this setup. Uh, because normally I would just sort of come in and this is what I want. Working with Alice with this, on the script, with changes, Alice would, uh, I would make suggestions, and Alice would take notes, and on the spot would sort of come up with rewrites. And then she would go away, and that night or the next morning would come in with, 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 with those, with even additional rewrites for those sections. So it, the piece got very strong as a result, I think, of, of the ensemble working and, and, and then developing finally a relationship with Alice and, and her just being very thorough. It's very, very meticulous, you know, down to the word. And, and, you know, the color, the shadings of words were very important. And I, I found that exciting. It was a little difficult, but it was extremely exciting to get into that kind of meticulous working mm -hmm. with a playwright. Because I've worked with playwrights who either, Ray Arana, for example, uh, at least with father, Sons and Fathers of Sons, was, was 
you know, he really didn't want too much of the word of his words changed. He didn't want too much of the punctuation changed. Uh, Samart Williams, on the other hand, would say to me, Walter, look, if you want to do it, do it. Don't blink. Just do it. Tell me what you've done. And so this was an interesting sort of mid middle ground, and it was the first for me. What happens when you have the playwright who doesn't want too much of his words changed, and you as a director know that they should be? We talk a lot and drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> a lot of coffee. Sometimes. You put on your comeback boots again? <laughs> In a way. And, and, and part of that, though, is, is coming to, to that vision, coming to that, sh that, that one vision. I'm not sure if, if a director, I don't think it's ever happened in my work. I don't think, for me, I never absolutely come to the same vision uh, with the playwright. Um, I get to a point where I, I see it, I understand it, I feel it on a very gut level, and then I have to deal with my vision as well of the piece. And, and then the merger, the fusion of the two, hopefully one illuminating the other, you know, is, is what then is the final piece. Uh, you know, I guess I look at, at the director more as kind of an interpreter or a who has the last visionary word? or something. Mm -hmm. uh, Pardon? Just, who has the last word? I was just going to ask that yeah. question. Who has the last word? It depends on who's strongest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think and, and, either should. I, I think the production gets the last word. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's what's right for the, for the piece. Yeah. Well, who, you know, who decides what's right? The it audience. Wants. Yeah. Well, First preview tells you a lot. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. That's, yeah. we, pre we do preview. Yeah. Mm. But uh, the, the audience is part of this collaboration, I think. Very, yes, very much. absolutely. And they tell us a lot. Mm -hmm. But you, you often hear, but the audience loved it. You know, and they keep on going on and on with the too long second act because the audience loved it. Preview audiences love it. And then suddenly you look at it on opening night and you realize that it is too long. And their answer is, but it was, they, they, they loved it. So somebody <laughs> did not make that decision. Somebody was listening to only an audience. Well, I don't want to mean only an audience, but it was listening to audience and not having a professional yeah. ear and eye as really well. really not detaching enough, because I think you stand in the back of the house, mm -hmm. and if the writer's there with you, you both hear, and if you can just push away from, I love this, I love this, and just forget about that, and just stay with the moments where the audience starts to fidget and is restless, I mean, they tell you everything. They tell you exactly what should go and what's working. Mm -hmm. And if you can push away from the rest, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're standing there with stars in your eyes, you got, you're in trouble, especially <laughs> during those and previews. And I mean, New York forget these, about But that. before yeah. the audience, I do think um, the playwright has to listen with uh, an ear that's not too painful to whatever needs cutting because the tendency to overwrite is there. And it's easy to see what's wrong to correct, but sometimes very good things have to be removed because they're standing in the way <coughs> of someone. But I think also uh, uh, we speak of the writer all the time, but I think the director, the actors, the designers, and uh, costumers, and so forth, they too have to have a give and take and listening. Otherwise, you might have five or six people who each have a vision. Uh, one has never done a certain color costuming, maybe, and say, I, this time I'm going to use the opportunity to do that. And someone else wants to experiment with a certain lighting. So the idea is if we're all coming together to go in a, a certain direction, and not each That's person. That's the ideal. Yes, mm -hmm. but I mean as much as possible. Not, mm -hmm. you know, not perfection. You're not going to get that. But I do think that you understand what I'm talking about. The uh, I asked oh, you yeah. as director on mm -hmm. that too. Yeah. Of uh, it's an interesting point you just brought up, Alice, about about having to take out good things sometimes yes. in order to make mm -hmm. the event work, as Terry was saying. We were out of town. I missed those out of town tryouts. Scott yes. and I were talking about that before. But um, uh, we were out of town, uh, the traditional out of town tryout. We opened in New Haven and then went on to Boston and Washington with a play called And Miss Weirden Drinks a Little by Paul Zendel, who wrote mm -hmm. Marigolds. And we had some incredibly funny stuff that just jumped, stopped the show dead. And we had to trim it out. Mm -hmm. In order to keep the story going, in order to keep the play going, we had to kill some of the most funny things. <laughs> and the playwright understood and went along oh, yeah. with the adult. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you agree with, the, with all that's being said about this? Oh, yeah, I think uh, the theater's a real collaborative 
effort genuinely not you know it is it, when it's fun and when it's enjoyable it's because it's like with Ming Cho Lee and the set I could have never in my wildest imaginings and I did some wild imagining you know I couldn't come up with anything that wild and beautiful and incredible that helped you know me focus the play even more um, so that collaborative aspect uh, is a wonderful thing when it's hard I think well I don't know but I think it's hard for a writer to take responsibility for having something to say for putting out uh, a personal perspective with their feelings and their passion and then have to do uh, and you have to do the thing of detaching yourself and stepping back a little and go well maybe just because I'm really pouring it out here and I'm putting my whatever on the line uh, doesn't mean that I did it perfectly the first time and we're gonna have to go in here and take it apart and examine oh that's disgusting you know and that's <laughs> ridiculous and this is foolish and you, you kind of have to be willing to be a little foolish and make mistakes and understand that that can be a wonderful process when you're doing it with other people who like believe in the play and who are putting all of their energy and their you know talent and thought into the piece uh, it can be a wonderful growing experience and the play is going to change and inevitably I mean I think it's for myself I like to kind of override a little bit in the first draft because there's more to throw out <laughs> I mean, you've got more possibilities, you know? uh, so I, I agree Definitely. I'd like to at some point get into the casting. How do how does a playwright feel about casting, and when does that happen? And wh where does that collaboration come in then on whether you feel someone is right for your play or not? But at this point, we're going to take a break, and uh, please don't go far away because we're coming right back again, and we'll have questions and answers from the audience. So be sure that you have everything ready and give it to Steve. Continuing the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre. And these seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I'm Isabel Stevenson and I'm President of the American Theatre Wing. And today's seminar is on the playwright and the director. We've di been discussing the relationship between the two. And now I'm going to turn it over to continue our discussion with Jean Dalrymple and Skylar Chapin co-moderators of this very, very interesting and important panel. Thank you. Hi, Jean. I would like to pick up, if I could, because uh, what we ought to talk about now, it seems to me, is directors, playwrights, and casting. And uh, who does what to whom, who has the last word, <laughs> et cetera. Uh, I don't know who to start with, but <laughs> why don't we start with Nancy? Oh, well, I was told when I had written a play, and everyone told me and told me and told me, and I thought, oh, I have real power now, that I was the final word on the casting. Mm. No one could put anyone in a play if I didn't want it. And I, and I, <laughs> it didn't seem to be a problem for me because I knew who I wanted already, and I spoke to Melvin about it, and Melvin said he thought that that was a brilliant idea and, and so forth. And as it turned out, um, I never had to get mulish, you know. Uh, we didn't end up with both the people that I had in mind, um, but because one of them accepted another job, and there we were without him. But um, we we found very amicably uh, a, a person that we both agreed agreed on, and. Um, I just really never had a, a problem. I didn't ever have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> I was very uh, if I uh, along with casting, if I can just throw in an, another interesting thing about the collaboration we were talking about before. Nancy's play uh, is basically a three-character play. There's two other people who appear at one point. But uh, it's uh, a man and his son and a girl who comes into their lives. Uh, the son, as written originally, was 12 years old. Was, oh, wasn't yeah, it 12? And when we were auditioning actors, uh, young actors for this, we just, somebody came in who was too old, but so good. <laughs> and we both had the same response, and, and Nancy adjusted the play to make it possible for a 15 year old 
we made him 15. He yeah. was actually six, yeah. 16. Yeah. His name, I, we shouldn't be shy about it. His name is Robert Leonard, and he's wonderful. He is mm. wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, but it was one of those things where the light went on. Yeah. And, and suddenly there were all sorts of possibilities, too, in the fact that he was older, uh, that weren't there in a 12-year-old. I'm working on the screen, uh, a screenplay of the, of, the, of the play now, or, or of, the, of the idea. It's not really of the play. It's changed all around so. But um, I, I went back to having Chris be 12. Mm -hmm. And um, the people who wanted me to do the screenplay started talking to me just last week about how wouldn't it be nice if he was 15 and this and that and the other. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Robert Leonard can play him. <laughs> the thing about casting is, is often it's um, serendipity. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Somebody wonderful comes along and you say, wow, let's, let's go that way. Yeah. Um, and, but always it's, I think, um, I think the contracts say that the writer has final approval and the director usually has final approval and the producer who pays <laughs> the people certainly has final approval. Let's continue with that. What contract? Where? Let's, let's talk about contract. Well, um, uh, the producer um, takes an option on the play mm -hmm. and has a contract with the writer. I think that's how that mm -hmm. works, generally through the Dramatists Guild, which is an organization but not a union. Uh, the Society of Stage Directors and Choreographers, which sounds like an organization, is in fact also a union. And we have a minimum basic agreement with producers. And uh, the producer, of course, is the one who is responsible for these contracts and, and certainly has the right and generally reserves the right to have, uh, so we all have final approval. So what happens is we collaborate <laughs> right up front. One more proof positive of the collaboration. Yeah. 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 Necessity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would like him, um, Patrick to, to just respond to that, however, the casting business, because it's, this, as we've said before, the wonderful situation here is we have both author and director, and mm -hmm. author and direct, author and direct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree, basically, that it is uh, it is a collaborative thing. I do, I mean, I feel like, uh, whoa, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, Broadway, off-Broadway contract, uh, I hold on to my, uh, my uh, 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 right to uh, have uh, a final, you know, approval, uh, and I know, and the director has final approval, too, so we, you know, we got to come up with two yeses before somebody's <laughs> there, uh, and, of course, the producer. Uh, but regionally, or well, regionally, um, oftentimes even when the playwright's going to be there, there's they have contractually no obligation to even consult you about anyone, and that's the way it is. And so sometimes you go into situations where uh, you may feel some mistakes have been made, but you might be wrong, and you have to deal with it anyway. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, um, but it is definitely a collaboration, you know, uh, here in New York. Uh, um, and sometimes it's, uh, I mean, uh, Max Meir and I did uh, play with, for Double Image called uh, Just Like the Lions. And uh, um, I was not, I, I didn't do my job in that production. Max did his job wonderfully, but I wasn't as available as I should have been for our first production of a piece. But we uh, cast the play together and we, I, 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 the only reason I bring it up is it's a, it was an interesting uh, example of an actor coming in and not playing the character the way we had seen the character, but playing something much more interesting and in a way exciting. And we went with it, and we just you know made this you know together this big leap. Okay, we're gonna you know because this is amazing and we can't uh, uh, not go with this. And it turned out to like totally warp the whole perspective of the piece and throw it way off balance because this guy was like the focus of the first act and he was in fact not the focus of the first act so and it was our fault in casting I mean uh, uh, it's a real funny business casting well, I, I find business. it most I must confess I, I'm not to be wholly trusted with casting <laughs> I find it very painful I know so many actors and if you look at 50 actors, if you need one, let's say they're all good. You're going to select one. But they feel you wouldn't even give me that, but the other 49 feel you, you couldn't see me doing that. And there's a hurt where there's a knowledge and a knowing actors uh, or others, you know, employed. Also, the most devastating thing, I think, is to have to drop 
anyone from a show after oh. it started. And I know years mm. ago, there were only two, three times, I think, where people were dropped and I knew them. Mm. The feeling is never the same between that person and you again if it's 25 years later. Oh. It's the sort of pain, and not only with the person they know, but with a show and uh, any, a new director or a new person that they have been rejected. Plus, I have a particular feeling for actors. They have to go constantly and show themselves and be evaluated and be dismissed, come back again, we'll look at you again, we'll talk mm -hmm. to you again, and then you find you didn't get anything and you didn't hear about it or you didn't know. Uh, you can't help. Uh, I, I try to run away from casting, uh, you know, that uh, I didn't show up to some of them, where I knew some of the people I knew, and when the film was done, I had a character part, and I knew the four ladies who were trying out for it, four actresses. And the others, three, one got it, and the other three felt uh, rejected. So no matter how much they say that's the business, there's pain in it. And uh, then once you've hired the person, I feel I'm not to be trusted because I'd let the show go down the drain before I want to fire someone who's <laughs> been hit, which is bad. Excuse me, because to get on this question about not being trusted, how do you feel completely at ease? You've got a show opening tonight, you've cast it, you, you're sitting here. We're very grateful to you for that. But what did you go through the casting process? You went through everything. Did you have the final word on it? I did. Uh, the, the show that I'm doing to, that opens tonight in Philadelphia is The uh, Investigation by Peter Weiss. And uh, it's associated with the college. Uh, I'm director of the School of Theater at the College of Performing Arts in Philadelphia. So it's a, it's a student production, basically. Um, but casting, again, more so, I think, in this case than casting. There's a cast of 35, so I used almost everybody. But um, important in this context was even casting the play. Uh, I felt that it was important um, to do a piece for graduating <coughs> seniors in an acting program that would take them, this would be the first piece that they've done, I think, in the, in the two years of their performing, that would take them beyond a play and into a larger issue um, the investigation deals with a trial 20 years after the Holocaust where survivors are actually face to face with some of the people who were accused of, of running uh, some of the concentration camps. Um, and so this takes them beyond the acting experience and into a, a whole world of history and knowledge. Um, but casting, in, in, in my, my casting experience has been um, a real learning experience here in New York. When I was in Atlanta with my company, I cast from my company. There was an ensemble. I chose plays with the company in mind. When I came to New York to do the first, my first show, I didn't know any of the, any of the New York actors. I mean, I really didn't, uh, except those that you, know, you see on television or something like that. But I didn't really know firsthand who would be good for particular roles. So it was very important for me to have uh, Doug Ward as the producer at the Negro Ensemble talk through my vision, my ideas about casting, and then to talk about some of the people who were lined up to be seen. So that he helped me sort of narrow down the field a bit. Um, I think we're going to go explore that much more now with some of the questions that, uh, are being we, that, that are being asked. Would you like to come up with the first question? Sure. My name is Daniel Coleman, and I'm a playwright and director, and I <coughs> recently directed my own play, Windmills, which, by the way, won the Gene Dalrymple Award for Best Docudrama this year. Just had to put that in. Um, <laughs> my question is to uh, Mr. Bernard. Um, how do you achieve consistency in, uh, in your work as a non-affiliated director? Um, how, do you go to your next production right away? Do you sit and wait and uh, hope that a lot of people will call you? Um, how does that work? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I wish it were possible to, uh, uh, to go on to the next always. Um, uh, there's not enough theater for all of us who want to continue working in it at the moment. Uh, I think uh, 
even with the regionals and uh, uh, the uh, number of theaters, there are a lot of us who want to direct. I find uh, that when I'm directing a play, my life stops. I mean, I concentrate exclusively on that play. So uh, it has to be pretty important to me to do that play. I, I, I say no to a lot of things that are good plays that I would like to see, but I don't particularly want to direct. Okay. Give us the <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Bill Schenker, and this question is for Patrick Myers. A question, it's, uh, this is a question from an actor's point of view. Do you feel that certain playwrights um, have a voice for an actor, or certain actors have the playwright's voice? How do you mean? Mm. Well, example, uh, uh, some of Michael Weller's plays, uh, supposedly John Hurd has I guess if uh, if, voice. if uh, actor maybe has a similar similar personal experiences to some of the characters that are uh, uh, in the play, or or similar uh, personal experiences that the playwright has in their life, maybe uh, down to living in the same area, you could pick up rhythms of speech and the way people express themselves, but also ideas and and just experiences. I I, I would think some actors would be more um, you know receptive to to certain playwrights than others. Yeah. Hi, my name is Larnie Rutledge. This question is directed to Walter Dallas. Uh, do you block the play uh, in advance, you know, on paper? Uh, and how much freedom do you give the actors? Uh, n I never block in advance. Um, I like to work through the actors uh, and explore the movement. I come in usually with a, a very good idea of the movement, uh, but I like to work the blocking in, in the process. Uh, and I give the, actors, give the actors a lot of freedom. Uh, I believe, again, following through with the idea of the collaboration. I have a good idea, I have a vision of what it should be, but uh, where directors you know, tend to be result-oriented, actors are more process-oriented, and I try to buy into that, that process and work, them, work with them through that process of discovery. So I give them a lot of creative space. My name is Mary Burns, and I have a question for Nancy. Um, how do you know during rewrites when you maybe have gone a step too far, lost sight of your original meaning? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, you get a, you get a, a, a sort of a, I think it's m mostly through what you see. If, if things begin to um, dissipate, and, and things don't hold together properly and the, and, and the center pin doesn't seem to be there anymore, then you know that you've lost sight of, 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 the, uh, uh, of the center pin. Uh, I did a whole rewrite of, of uh, I did, I think, about 38 scripts of the Beach House, all told, I mean versions, uh, if you counted all of them. And one of them, uh, maybe six of them, in fact, were um, completely wrong, but this was before I was in production. Uh, they became hysterical in, 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 in an attempt to be funny. Everything was funny. Everything was uh, fever pitch. Everything was funny, 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 you know, and, and, uh, and I thought it was wonderful. You know, I read it and laughed, you know, and I showed it to um, uh, various people and they said, this is very... Uh, hysterical, you know. Um, that's my, I know that that's my danger, that um, I, I can find funny things to say and I can, uh, uh, that come out of the way people really are, but that sometimes I push too far with that so that it becomes not how people really are. Thank and you. I've... Hi, I'm Tom Werder. This is for Terry. Um, you, some of you have said that when you're reading a play or writing a play, um, the characters begin to speak to you. I wonder if you have visions about what your, your production is going to look like, and then how does that affect the working process with the designers and the playwright? Yeah, I, I start to visualize what the play is going to look like. I think it's, again, the collaborative effort that we're talking about. I think it's very important to be able to sit down and talk with the set designer, the lighting designer, costume sound, and talk in images because they can create from there. And I think in way before you 
even start casting if possible, if these discussions can go on and it can be really an open forum between you. But if you've got specific images you're talking about, I think it makes it much easier for a designer to pick up on that, to translate that into his own language and to go from there. I mean, kinds of lighting, the mood you want. I mean, do you want gobos? Do you want effects like that? Or what kind of effects do you want? What are you trying to say through the lighting? Uh, I think lighting is a, an integral, integral part of a production. And uh, I think a lot of things can go wrong when the lighting goes wrong, or the same thing with a set. Uh, if it's just wrong for that stage or wrong for that theater, uh, it's really in the way of the production. And it's, it's very important that you do your homework way in advance so you can sit down and have very specific discussions. Hmm. Thank you. That's interesting. Your, your theater is part of your homework then. Oh, is it ever? When does that come into it? Well. I like to really get started on a script six months in advance. I mean, that's ideal, but I just won't take anything and go into rehearsal with it tomorrow. Uh, I don't care to work that way. And I really want to know what I'm going to do so I can have plenty of time to read the script, to let it sink into me. Uh, Melvin, you said it becomes your whole life. It does. And uh, the months of research that you do on a script, I'm in the process of working on Miracle Worker right now for a production in Japan. And I mean, I've already started tons of work at the Helen Keller Institute and the books I want to read so that I know what I'm talking about when I get there. And already, you know, a big collaboration with the set designer. We've been flown over there and seen the theater and what we want to do with the set. And uh, some things just about the, about the play we feel very strongly. Thank you. Hi, this question is for Ms. Childress. I was wondering if you could say a few words about the idea of writing about a subject that is in the public domain, and also um, if you could say a few words about ob obtaining the rights of writing about a person's life. Um, when you say public domain, it means you can do it, right? Uh, you're free to do it, but what was the other part? You about actually having a real person to write Oh, getting about permission to do someone's mm -hmm. uh, life. <clears throat> I don't know a great deal about that. I've had some people come to me to ask me to do their stories or someone else they're interested in. You would have to get uh, clearance, not only for that person, but you're dealing with other lives uh, in order to tell your story, not just that central character. And if they're living uh, uh, people, uh, you would have to find some sort of clearance and a, agreement there. What's in public domain, you're free to use that as long as you don't slander, hurt, abuse uh, in some way living people around them. And I hope also we wouldn't slander or abuse just for a cheap trick, a person mm -hmm. who's gone. But um, the living character would be the most difficult, I think, to get uh, clearance and make sure there's no infringing upon other people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to ask what she means by public domain. That usually is about something that's written or published and copyrighted and so forth, and then goes into public domain. What do you, what do you mean in this case about a person being in public domain? Um, just being something that is um, is free is is a true life experience and well that doesn't put it in public domain all right Jean, mm -hmm. what is public domain well public domain <coughs> is just as i said something that's been copyrighted and the copyright has, has run, run out, out. Mm -hmm. right i that's think she different. also meant uh, a person when a person dies anyone mm -hmm. is free right. to write they, they think their life story as mind. long as i'm saying they don't then fall over into right. a taking real person advantage of others mm -hmm. thank you what you come up <coughs> hi my name is nancy gallman and this is for terry schreiber um i was wondering since you're running a theater school now whether there are any books or plays that you could suggest to new writers and directors uh. As far as the directing book, I have a directing unit at my studio, and I still think my Bible is on directing by Harold Clerman. I think it's the best book on the subject ever written. I think Harold said it all in the book and said it very, very clearly. It's, I think it's a real Bible. Uh, as far as an acting book, uh, my favorite book is The Craftsman of Dionysus by James Rockwood, and also On Method Acting by William Dwight Estee. I think they're two of the best acting books I've ever read. 
as far as writing, I don't know on that. That's more <laughs> of a subject for Patrick or the other writers or Alice or Nancy. My name is Murdis Mixon, and this is a question for Melvin Bernard. Is there an apprentice program to get into the society of stage directors and choreographers? I mean, is that the way you get into that? No, you get a job. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same as actors' equity. You get a job, you join the union. Actually, you can direct or choreograph, I think, on, I'm not sure, but I think it's uh, one show or two shows in a regional theater before you have to join the union. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's that old catch-22 that you have to work before you can become... You can a actually member. join the union if you want to. How? By paying the uh, initiation fee. Don't you have to be qualified? Do you take well, if you're a director, you're qualified. Or a choreographer, you're qualified. Even if you have not, do you have no credentials to show as a director or choreographer? You have to have worked, no? I, I, I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> but not necessarily professionally. I see. <coughs> You've talked about theater all around, and, and um, you just very, very casually said something about uh, theater in Japan. <coughs> the audience is different there. Are you? A, do you have to adapt your plays to a, a the audience is very different. Audience, a, a different reaction. Uh -huh. The audience is very polite. They come to listen. Uh, I think there's the wonderful story when Chorus Line was just there, and uh, Donna McKechnie did her big dance. And she always uses the applause after that big number to catch her breath so she can go on with the next scene. They just sat there <laughs> with their arms folded and nodded towards the stage. And uh, it gets, <laughs> and she died during the next scene. <laughs> she was playing the whole next scene like that, trying, still trying to catch her breath. But uh, uh, the first time I directed a play there, uh, you're really hurt because all of a sudden the act ends and nobody applauds and you think, oh God, I just laid the biggest egg in the world here. But it's just the way they respond. And, and then there could be a tremendous applause at the end or peeping, people running down with flowers, which oh, usually goes on endlessly. Uh, they each have their fan clubs usually. What about the way the actors work? The way well, the actors, uh, it's an incredible discipline. Uh, they do two performances a day, seven days a week for a month. Bring that up with Actors' Equity. Uh, <laughs> and there's no playing six performances in one week. Uh, I had an amazing experience last summer. I was directing Bent, and my leading man who was playing Max was also a lead on television. And we would rehearse from 11 to 8, and he would always be there at 10 with the rest of the actors stretching out on the floor and getting ready to work. I usually got there at 10.30, and at 11 o'clock, we went to work. And at 8 o'clock, he would leave and go to the television studio. And he just, I mean, they work and work and work. And it's very interesting, technically, because the stage manager does not call the show. Each department is responsible for their queuing. So the things I've learned from that is it's a blessing to move into the theater because you usually only have a couple of days with tech and then you open cold. There's no previews. Uh, but by the time you go into the theater, all the sound has been put in in rehearsal. The sound man is there with a full setup the second week of rehearsal. So you really have time to play with sound. All the costuming is done in rehearsal. You don't have to listen to a customer saying, you're ruining my palette, you must see the whole. They bring it in. And so the only thing left to be done when you move into the theater really is the set and the lighting. How large a theater was it? How many seats? Well, I'll be in a 1,200 seat theater this summer. Uh, the last two years it's been about 800. How much? Can you get the equivalent of, of the American dollar? How much would it be for cost of I ticket? think tickets are like $25, $30. Mm -hmm. and, and they really fill it up. Uh, we're already three quarters sold out for Miracle Worker, and that was in March. Mm -hmm. Mainly women. Wonderful. Because of the plays play like at noon and five o'clock, so the theater audience is largely women. What's it like in Philadelphia? <laughs> <laughs> I come to New York as often as I can. <laughs> um, I'm. Uh, as a, it's a little slow in Philly right now. <laughs> well, no, it was an important part of the tour. You, you touch on it briefly about opening in Philadelphia and going on to Boston, <laughs> New Haven. And so there are different audiences there. Now yes, there's there, stations there. Yes. Um, there, there's a, a, I guess, what would be the equivalent. There's a very strong sort of off and off, off Broadway equivalent in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. There are small companies doing some very incredible work. And then, of course, there are the large houses there, the, the forest. Uh, Joel Gray is there now with cabaret musicals come through. The Schubert Theater, which used to be uh, a road co company house, is, is now part of the Colleges of Performing Arts. Um, so we have college performances there. Um, 
but I think it's an, it's, an, it's an interesting theater town. It's not an overwhelmingly exciting place, but there, there's a pocket of real heavy support for theater in Philadelphia. And they support theater there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's a nice note for us to have to bring this to an end, and I feel so bad because there's so much more that I want to ask, so many more questions that I want to ask, and there is so much more to say, but once more, not enough time, and I have to say I'm Isabel Stevenson, president of the American Theater Wing, and this is but one of the year-round programs. This is uh, the seminar on working in the theater, and today's seminar is on the very, very important part of theater, the playwright and the director and the magic that comes out of that. And our co-moderators, uh, Jean Dalrymple and Skylar Chapin have done a wonderful job of probing here, and I wish we had more time to continue. Thank you for coming. This seminar is coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University in New York, which is located in the heart of the theater on 42nd Street. Thank you for being here. This was some significant, some middle, middle ground. First, the first.